Hello, uh, welcome to another lived quality conversation. And uh, once again, uh, I have Wana with me today. Uh, Wana has been on the uh, on the channel before, and we've spoken on different things. Our most recent conversation was about the pursuit of purpose. That's what it turned out to be. Uh, and as it is uh, on lived quality conversations, we usually do not start out with a premeditated conversation. We just get into it and follow it wherever it's going and um, make sense of it as how it is emerging for us. So welcome, Wana. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you and to speak with you, uh, you know, and traverse these strange concepts together. So I'm so privileged to have you on the channel and I'm curious how you've been feeling, how you are, what's on your mind. Um, I'll pass to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey, Clayton, I'm well. Uh, it's been great to have these conversations and I always enjoy um, chatting with you because it always leads to something um, like new and I get really excited about the depth of information that we get out of these conversations. So I'm really grateful that you create this space and this time. Um, for me lately, what has been uh, happening I suppose a lot of things, and it's a culmination of different things we've spoken about in the past and more recently as well. I've been meditating on some of the conversations we've had, but also listening to you and OG Rose, um, some of the conversations you guys have been having, those have been so inspiring. Uh, and I really appreciate the development in my own thinking and perspective uh, when I view all aspects of my life, I suppose, and in particular when I'm thinking about my work and thinking about my purpose that we spoke about and just, yeah, there's, there's been this, I've been noticing within me, there's been this itch to like be in a place where, and I don't know, I've, I've heard a lot of people recently uh, wanting to find their purpose or wanting to find their, their fit. It's like we, we always sense there's something within us that's calling us to a different thing or something that is still needing. And so yeah, I've been surrounded by people who are talking about, uh, oh, I, you know, I just want to find my my niche. I want, just want to find my purpose or find my um, the thing that I fit into, the, the people that I serve. And that's kind of been a theme lately in the last few weeks. Um, and the other thing is just like I was contemplating on this uh, idea of like what would it be like as I'm – because I mentioned earlier to you as well that I'm going for an interview um, this week – and I was just really thinking about like how much prep I do and how I kill myself over it. And, and I thought, what would it be like if I could just know that I won't fail? Like whether I get the job or not, I would like just to know that I won't fail. Like I'll be able to at least hold a conversation and address the questions. And I don't know, there's just something about knowing what's on the other side that makes us nervous makes us scared when we're thinking about things that are new and so I was just like contemplating on this and thinking wow wouldn't it be so easy life would be a lot better if we knew what's lying on the other side or how this would end and um you know it's I, for myself it's interesting because now having had conversations but also doing a lot of internal self-growth I found myself when they called me for the interview um having this sensation of like, I don't mind which way it goes. Like my life is beautiful at the moment. It's, it's where I want to be. And it's, it's really exciting. Some of the things that are happening and I don't mind if this was to realize itself. And if it didn't, that would be more than fine. Um, and it was such a beautiful sensation. It was this sensation of like gratitude for where I'm at, but also gratitude for what's to come and knowing that the right doors will open and the ones that are not for me will close or remain closed. Um, but then there was this pop-up of this, you know, sensation of like, what would it be like just to know that, I don't know, you want to preserve your integrity within every situation, right? So I'm thinking like, I'd love to not embarrass myself is what I'm saying. Like, I'd love to not have this terrible interview or, you know, say something that doesn't fit, but to at least have a clue as to what I'm talking about and have good examples, even if the job doesn't necessarily, you know, become mine. But that's sort of where I'm at. And I'm just really paying attention to how I'm feeling 
um, and paying attention to take responsibility for how I'm responding to things. And it's been one of those journeys that um, I really have become more aware of since reading a book that um, I finished, but also bought the hard copy. So I initially read the audio book. Um, but I've been really intrigued by it. And it's called the habit, breaking the habit of being yourself. And in there, it talks a lot about, you know, the common habits or the habits that we've instilled over a long period of time that we just sort of fall into. Um, and so I've been really focusing on that and, and really paying attention to the subconscious habits that I might have and, and trying to be more conscious of them and trying to be more present in the moment to notice those moments where I'm just falling into a habit and it might not serve me or it might not be the habit that I want to practice. So I don't know, that's a that's a mouthful, but um, that's sort of where I'm at. Oh, great. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And there's a, there's a lot in there that, you know, what I was hearing. Uh, as as you're sharing that, you know, lots of themes on um, uh, it sort of feels like you're trying to know yourself more, uh, but in a, in a more granular way, like to try and understand the finer details of um, how you are, like moment to moment, how you, how you are being in each moment that's unfolding uh, for you. And 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 you know you're you're observing yourself you're contemplating on um what is likely to come trying to understand how you have dealt with uh uh what has just passed right and to to better prepare yourself for what is to come and i think um that that's great like we 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 all should be doing that because uh, the question you asked earlier, how can you know um, how it's going to turn out? Uh, I think this is the work that needs to happen. Like pa partly this is by understanding where you're coming from and really how you're fitting the situation in which you are. Um, it feels like you get a better, like a better hold on what it is, uh, it, it, a better grip on on the situation not that you're going to control it but you you can feel through the situation to to what you know to the the the, the parts of it that may unfold and how they're likely to unfold you can feel through that by really um being more open being more sensitive to what's happening around you and how you're engaging with it and at the same time you touched something uh important there with the gratitude it's like uh before you can even take a step forward you have to acknowledge where you are you have to appreciate where you've gotten to and uh not dismiss that like many many a times uh, i've had uh friends in conversation tell me that uh you know they 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 highly underrate their their value their potential and what and their capability uh they, they'll say something like i'm never good at this or i never do this uh but the never is sort of like uh a, a very big estimate it means like in in all of your existence this hasn't happened but what they really mean is something like they don't feel like they're getting to the place where they want to get with that thing. But however, they're making progress. And what I always recommend is to, you know, to appreciate, like it, it can't not be, there has to be something that you could appreciate, uh, however little it may be. And so I think that practice of, um, of gratitude and appreciation of, of you know, every, every progress you make it's sort of like one one piece that can help you to um, sort of like be ready for how it unfolds, right? Like you 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 say mm -hmm. that um, you're at this stage whereby you don't you're not really so worried about which way it's going to go. You're you're looking forward to the experience of it, so you you know you can you can have it, and you don't feel like whichever way it goes, you know, the interview like if, whether you. You, you you succeed whether it's, it goes very positively or it goes negatively. You you at this point where you feel like you're open 
to the mystery that it's going that's going to unfold in that moment and you're sort of excited for it because you don't know where it's going it's mm-hmm. kind of like this when we started the conversation it's like we don't know where it's going or what we're going to think about and so we were just holding ourselves in this open way and you know when you were sharing there I was I was just listening to whatever you're telling me just to see how it's impacting me and and what emerges and this is all that's happening and and it's i think it's it's when we when we do that we get closer to the place where we need to be in relationship to whatever it is that we're relating to and it's not i think naturally humans like to think in a moral way so we're, we're always quickly being drawn to is it right is it wrong um but I feel like it's not even, it has nothing to do with the moral aspect. It's more, it's before the moral aspect. It's, it's more like just being there. It's like, what mm-hmm. is this? Like, li- what is this experience? What does it feel like? And by embracing that and being open to it, we start to, like, we start to resonate with, with that experience. And it starts to sort of like shape us uh you know give us like signals of how to follow it or which way to go um and you know sometimes they'll come through our emotions how we're feeling i was having a a bit of a text chat with a friend and i was trying to articulate that uh, all these emotions they are they're signals right they, they they don't have an opinion they're just telling you what it is and in most cases they're giving you information about the boundary of where you're going and what you're trying or what you're experiencing around yourself right what you're expressing yourself to how you're relating and so a negative emotion is sort of like telling you hey you you, you've hit something maybe try not to go more (laughs) in that direction and the positive emotion is sort of like drawing you in it's like all the the you know all the good experience that you want and makes you happy and you you want to do more of that um however sometimes we get locked up in our minds like you know uh, our concepts our our assumptions of what we've been taught like you know we've been told uh this is what good is and this is what not good is and so when we feel it we can't be conflicted about it. And so we don't know. It could be a new experience of good, but because we have also, we're also carrying these concepts that we've been taught, you know, we get challenged in how to mm-hmm. integrate the experiences and what, what we, you know, which, where do we put it? Because we were given these things. So um, we need to consult since someone else gave us these things. It's like we've discovered something new. We don't know where it fits because we did not define the categories. We only got told these categories and we just worked with them. And so I feel like when we start to do what you're doing, like really paying attention and trying to understand better, uh, we we develop a sensitivity like to be able to interpret, you know, through the felt experience, what we should pursue more of and what we not need to pursue kind of uh you know where the edge is it's like i can't push beyond this because when i try to it's a terrible experience uh, so maybe i need to do it in a different way and uh, and sometimes uh it may be a challenge it's like it's a an ability you have to cultivate it's like i i need to develop strength so that i can push through it Oh, sometimes it's uh, a technique you need to cultivate. It's like, oh, I need to develop a technique of how to go around it. Uh, and sometimes it could be uh, just something that I, I, I don't think uh, this I'm meant to go through this or over this. I'm meant to go in a different direction. So you know, it sort of gives us that sensitivity, that ability to be able to distinguish between those uh different modalities by which we're approaching the experience. And I think it's through understanding ourselves and knowing who we are that we can, you know, surpass those challenges and find our way through them. And 
and once we've developed that way, then the history of that way of like the the the, the continued compounding um, uh, successful execution of that way starts to unfold as our you know as our uh, reputation, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it starts to unfold as our reputation, and then that feeds us into we now get a sense for integrity. It's like, oh, I'm not the person who does this. I'm mostly the person who sort of like aligns myself in this way. And so I need to respect <laughs> my own <laughs> reputation and mind how I'm shaping it because with every action that I take, it has, you know, a, a, a few more steps in the future, it will matter. And so it may not feel like it matters right now, but it's definitely going to matter. And so, you know, that, going back to that book you're talking about, breaking the habit of being uh, yourself, I think it's very relevant and it's, it's such an important skill set to cultivate uh, because we, we have to appreciate that we're always changing, right? And we have to change. Like what the, what's the saying about, change is the only constant, right? Like <laughs> if you, re there, there used to be this uh, line they told us in schools, like uh, if you, if you refuse to change, then change will change you, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like change is the only constant that's always going to happen. So your world is going to always be changing. You're always going to be changing. It's more like you need to align these changes such that they are changing at the same rate uh, so that it doesn't feel like, you're being left behind or the world is getting out of reach from you. You are the exact appropriate uh, space or relation to it such that you can keep up the way you need to be keeping up and taking, you know, whatever it has mm -hmm. to offer and learning from it as you also give to it and uh, transcend yourself and follow and follow. Uh, so, yes, uh, I, I know I've said a bunch of stuff there. I'll give it back to you and see what you make of it. Wow, that was great. I really enjoyed that because it actually, a lot of the concepts that you discussed there were actually part of this book that I was reading. And um, you spoke about this um, evolving or this this process by which we are all growing, right? And there's, you know, certain things that we can see or we can perceive about ourselves and uh, other things that might be in the subconscious which we need to then pay more attention or be more intentional to recognize and to um, sit with. Um, and that is the part that really takes work. And so in the book, it talks a lot about how to turn inward, which you spoke about as well, looking at ourselves. So turning inward and recognizing what's going on. And a lot of the habits that we've grown up with have been developed subconsciously and haphazardly, really, because we sort of just go through the motions, I think, as we're growing and a lot of the times our parents don't have this awareness. Well, my generation didn't, didn't have this awareness to even ask themselves to pay attention to every habit that they um, engage in and to ask themselves, is this part of who I want to be? And so you spoke about how, you know, we go from habit, we're doing these things every single day. Uh, one example can be, you know, when you wake up, what's the first thing that you do in the morning? Well, it might be that you brush your teeth. It might be that you're preparing coffee. It might be that you exercise, whatever it might be. But a lot of the times, because we've been doing things for so long, we don't even recognize the steps that we're taking. It just happens, right? It's become our habit. We fall into it and then we roll to the next thing and the next thing. And so it's a subconscious type of living. And so the book talks a lot about paying attention and understanding the different uh, waves of the mind, understanding the different spheres of the mind and recognizing their relationship to each other and recognizing how neurons are created because of the links that we have with certain habits. And I found it really interesting because, you know, we we often get stuck, right? We We get stuck in life. We get stuck in our careers maybe. Or you might have like a midlife crisis point where you recognize that where you are is not where you want it to be. And what we don't see is that the habits and the things that we're doing every single day, the choices we're making, the votes we're casting towards all the things from what you're buying to what you're engaging in to what, how you're spending your time, propel us into the present that we find ourselves in. 
they're the reasons that we're where we are, right? And so if we're having a midlife crisis and saying that we don't really want to be where we are or perhaps we're not really liking the person we become, then we need to have a dialogue with ourselves and ask about what has allowed me to come to this place. And when that dialogue happens, uh, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of intentionality to sit with yourself and it's extremely uncomfortable because for the first time you're paying attention to you. And that's a process by which, you know, you can engage in um, different modes of, of achieving this, but it's really about being still, being quiet and really hearing what it is that your self is responding to certain questions that you might ask. And so those questions then bring clarity and you can recognize, okay, well, I'm this person, I'm that, that thing. And then as we go about our daily life, one of the aspects that I found really challenging is that to be intentional while I'm doing the thing, that's a real challenge because, you know, you find yourself in the thing and it's sort of automatic and you can pay attention for like one second, five minutes, but then you sort of lose that, you know, attention span. Um, and in this day and age, our attention span has been shortened extremely. But when I'm paying attention, I can recognize, oh, I really don't like that thing about me. I don't like how I responded to that thing or there's, you know, and you, what I found in my, my own seeking is that there are patterns and I can see now as I've been paying more attention, I can see how the patterns have evolved. And so, for example, on Saturday, I was going to an event, a uh, uh, sip and paint event. And, you know, I have been planning this for months. I thought it was going to be a great um little exercise or like a little thing that I could just do like a social event and it would be so much fun. And I would walk away with this incredible painting. Um, but what ended up happening is that one, I was late to the class and the class was starting at one. And, you know, I, for whatever reason, there was a bunch of events that happened prior and that led me to be late. And I was like, how did this happen? Because I planned this, I knew where I was going, you know, then the rain hit, then the traffic was horrible, like all these things in the way that really made me and my state of being a lot more elevated. I was in an mm -hmm. elevated state of being that really didn't want to be in a paint session right now, you know, <laughs> like mm -hmm. I get there, I got there 20 minutes late and I'm just not in the mood to be painting. And so um, what happened was that I, um, sat down and I thought, okay, just chill, try and try and do the best thing you can with this painting. And then I find that the teacher, because it was a large crowd, she didn't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. And so there wasn't that attention of detail that she could offer me to, to teach me the techniques and to have this incredible painting. And so I'm walking away with this painting that I'm not very happy with. I've scrubbed it out so many times and I'm like oh now I'm blaming myself because I'm not in um a good state of mind and I didn't get the result that I expected to have this nice painting and just feel really good about myself and so I took that experience and I've really been thinking about it and just pondering on what allowed me to feel and respond that way now in the past it would have been a lot worse and so I was grateful initially that I didn't react so extreme. I wasn't super uh, depressed about it. I wasn't, um, you know, festering over it over the whole weekend. It wasn't something that was like, oh, you're terrible and, you know, self-blaming. But it sort of just stuck with me to ask what aspect of my behavior of my or my intention was lacking where I couldn't show up fully accepting of the situation and going along with it because when I initially walked mm. in I had this like oh my gosh I'm sorry for this and he hasn't even started and I really don't want to be in this place but okay I'll just push through and it's gonna be okay and I was swift enough to get over it but I still didn't like myself for having had that kind of feeling and that putting that kind of face on because people can see your facial expression mm. and they can also read your body language, right? And so when you're in not in a good mood, you don't want to be somewhere. People recognize that. There's an aura that you send. There's a sensation that you send in the room. And so, you know, people will will feel that out. And so I didn't like that. And it, it caused me to reflect and say, okay, how do I prepare for next time? What is it that I need to tune into within myself that can shift that a little bit where I can be fully present and I can be fully engaging and fully myself the way that I want to be um 
and and no matter what happens, right? I'm going to find myself in terrible situations over and over again throughout my life because I don't control external events. I don't control the weather. I don't control other people's perception of me. I don't control other people's ideals. And so things are going to pop up, right, throughout my life and be against what I think or what I might consider good, bad, whatever. And so one of the things that the book talks about is that it makes reference to looking or identifying. So first looking at someone maybe that you might admire or someone that you look up to or identifying set, set characteristics or an ideal of the self that you want to be and then focusing yourself on that. And so for me, like John Maxwell comes to mind. I, I love his teachings. I love his um, personality. I love the way that he delivers lectures and that he delivers materials. And so I often think back on him and I sort of reflect on his character. And I think if I could just pick out certain characteristics of his and work on, you know, allowing those to be, I suppose you would absorb that kind of character or focus on that character in your meditative practice and, and really hone in on what that character looks like in, in any situation. And then perhaps that will help me to shift my perspective and to shift the way that I show up. And so I think it's a constant back and forth of there are signs and symptoms you spoke about earlier that show us you know, who we are, they tell us a story in terms of our behavior, right? We're looking at our behavior and going, okay, I did that. Why did I do that? So asking questions is really important. And then as the feedback comes, we need to be engaging and intentional to say, is that how I want to show up in the world? And if it isn't, then what am I going to do about it? Will I sit with myself and ask questions to identify where that's coming from, why that's showing up? And then mm you know, sit with myself in peace and quiet to find out how I can shift this. Because I think it's really important that, you know, and all the greats say this, that your future doesn't just happen. Nothing great happens haphazardly. There's there's always a plan. Like we have a plan for everything. Like I have a plan for the day. I have a plan for my kids. I have a plan for um, how I'm going to get to work. Like we, there are plans. And most of the time we tend to plan the very unimportant little things but we're not planning the big things like our life. We're not planning where we want to end up. We're not planning what the year will end up like. We're not planning towards our future or desired um, retirement or desired job or desired state of being and state of living. And so I think it's really helped me to, and, and this is a struggle for me even now, like I really struggle with this to slow down and to be like, where am I at? Why are these things happening? Why am I at this point? And even with this interview, I'm like, okay, what can I do? How can I prepare? So I'm asking everyone, you know, give me a template. What do you think I should prepare? And it's like, I just keep having this sensation that I just need to sit back and just be with myself because I've done enough learning and, and growing and expanding and stretching that I think with this interview, it will carry me through. Uh, because I've always been a person who does above and beyond what is required. And so if you're that person, I suppose uh, the good news is that sometimes you need to just step back and not do so much, but just be present with what's happening right here, right now. So I'll give it back to you. Oh, wow. Um, that was so rich. And uh, I'm in complete agreement with uh, all you've shared there. Let me see if I run through. I was trying to take some notes so I can keep up <laughs> with everything that was coming up. It's, uh, it was so beautiful. Um, so you, you, you touched on the, you know, intentionality, right? And like, we, we, before you can apply the intentionality, you have to acknowledge that, that you have the ability to, like you have the ability to be intentional and uh and and make the choice uh sometimes it's knowing that also means that you know the responsibility that you're signing up for because um what happens is if you are being intentional then you are also being accountable for however this is going to turn out so it, it's um how do I say it? it's a daunting task? Like it's 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 a big challenge that we have to raise ourselves up to. Um, however, like I think it pays off. It pays off because um, then you 
you can anticipate your, you know, your potential consequences and then uh, decide to accept them before they even happen to you. So they're not surprising because when we get surprised, then uh, we have all these emotions that we don't understand all coming up at us in a huge compounded wave that, you know, just throws us off balance. And, you know, you touched on um, paying attention. It's interesting, like, how we, we even term it, it's like paying attention. It's like we have to pay this attention. We have to, it's like to maintain our mind attending to a specific thing, it's, uh, it's a form of payment because our mind does not want to stay in the same place for too long. Um, uh, I think in John Vaveki's work, he touches it a little bit that we have those two systems, uh, the, the task, I think the task focus network in our, in our nervous system, which is making us focus. And then there's, uh, I forget the other term, but it, it, the, the other part of our nervous system that makes us wander. And so the two have, like our minds keep swinging between the two, between focusing on something and then wandering uh, so that we can uh, cultivate more insights. And, and for us to, like, like the moment we've, uh, we've kept our mind on something for too long, it's going to develop the appetite to wander. It's like, it, it feels, you know, it needs to move a little bit. And, and, and it's different for everyone, of course. It's like, how long you, you, you maintain the attention for and how much you need to wander, it's going to vary from person to person, but it happens for everyone. And and I think, uh, like you said, the, the marketing people, like all these uh, social media platforms and uh, adverts, they're playing on that. They're trying to trick our minds in such a way that they can hold them to whatever they want to hold them on uh, for as long as possible. And it works. Like they figured out how to hack us. Like they, they, they trick us in all these little ways. Um, however, we find that after after paying all that attention, it doesn't pay off. <laughs> so we 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 go back and go like, oh, I I feel like I wasted my time. It, it wouldn't be a waste if it paid off, right? Like the the capability to do that is the same thing. It's just that the outcome uh, at the end of it will determine uh, whether you're happy with it or not and and when you're happy with it you don't mind you don't you don't consider it as paying attention right yeah. because you just it, it took you to where you wanted to go but when uh it's effortful and it doesn't pay off all of a sudden you feel like i kind of feel like i got short change like i met this whole huge payment of attention and time and i didn't i didn't get anything in return um uh but yeah so it, it it's very interesting that we, we term it that way, but, but I think it's important for us to do that because um, it's how, it's like we have to continuously attend to ourselves. And before we can do that, we have to appreciate that we are not a static being. It's like we're, we are a living being that has life in it and life, the nature of life is that it's always shifting and always transforming. So we have to be, a, attentive to the little changes because those changes have big meanings and uh, those side effects of the changes happening, if we do not know how they came to be, then we fall into surprise, then we fall into disarray, then we start to feel anxious, and then we start asking all those questions you are asking, you know, when, when, when you happen to, you know, run late for that event, and then you're wondering, how did I end up this way? How, how is it that I... You know, I, I planned this. I thought about it for a long time. How did all this happen and put me off my original uh, plan that I anticipated? And and it could be something little, and it could be something that is out of your control, like the weather, <laughs> or an accident happens on the road. Um, however, like knowing how to relate to all these events and all these things that imagine. Um, is very, very helpful because then you quickly get unstuck. Otherwise, you get stuck. You spoke about being stuck, right? Uh, we do get stuck when we don't know what it means. And so we want 
we want to explore it until we, 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 we get to the resolution point of what it means and then we can move on. But when we don't know, it's like we're stuck in this loop of indifference because we, we feel there's a difference, but we can't recognize it. And so it reminds me of um, Ken Wilber's uh, quadrants uh, of, of, you know, uh, re relating, whereby you have the I where you're relating with yourself and you know that those things are within your control. It's all about you managing your yourself. Then you have the we space, kind of like what we have right now, uh, in that we, we have to engage cordially and, and manage it. Uh, but then you have the it and the it's, which are not things we control, but we respond to and we relate to. Um, I, I always like to use the example of the road. And, you know, and the weather is even a much better example because you, you have always to adjust to the weather, right? Like it's, it's hot right now. You, you have to find a way to cool yourself or just contend with the heat. <laughs> the weather doesn't really care what you do. It's just going to do what it does. So similarly, like the road goes a certain way. And if you're driving, you have to follow the road. Uh, if you don't follow the road, then problems will happen and you're likely to get hurt. Um, so those are some of the things that came up for me. But the other thing that I really liked that you touched on there was um, having that, uh, you know, awareness to always try and um, plan. And when, when you said plan, I was thinking about the thing that came for me was uh, imaginal anticipation. It's like sometimes we think uh, plan is just about writing things down. Uh, but no, you have to actually visualize them in your mind, like really play that scenario and try to see how does it actually work? How do you fit in that scenario? Uh, it sort of like gives you uh, a preview, like practice before you actually get into the situation. And so that's why I'm calling it the imaginal anticipation, but doing it in a serious way, uh, because, uh, you know, it's the same thing that children do when they play, like they, they when the Playing pretend, it's a very serious game. It's and they're playing at the conceptual level. It's not like they, it's not like they're mimicking, right? It's not like they're parroting the experience. No, they they're interpreting that experience in their own way. And if you hold the the, the pretend cup wrong, if you're having uh, a tea party, uh, and you you twist it a bit, they'll tell you, hey, you're spilling your tea. Please hold it up. You're gonna make a big mess. And they have to clean up the pretend mess as well because <laughs> even if <laughs> Because in this visualized imaginary world, everything is serious. Everything has a meaning. Everything you do has a response. And so in that way, they're able to actually simulate it to the point whereby when they get to the situation of actually doing it, they've learned so much from the simulation. And I think planning is, we need to approach planning in that way, like as a simulation, uh, rather than as a, a wish list. Uh, <laughs> Because it's not a wish list. It's, it's more than that. And if we actually take it seriously, then we, we prepare ourselves. And then our plan will actually enable us to succeed. Uh, so like you were speaking about the interview and, and people sh sharing all these uh, techniques you should try. Like what I would even recommend is if you can get them to try out the scenario with you. Like if it's a new scenario that they're suggesting of something you could do, uh, you could ask them to enact it out. It's like, hey, look, you know, you said maybe I need to be able to answer in this way. Let's let's role play for a little bit and see if you're my interviewer and you asked me a similar question around that. I think I would respond this way. Is that what you mean? Because uh, like we were saying with Daniel in the language uh, episode, language is just a pointer to experience uh, and you it's n it compresses the experience and to just give you an idea of it. But we have to decompress uh, that experience and try to immerse ourselves in it again for it to come alive to us and be able to get all the details and nuances that it, that, that were packaged within that. Um, so, yeah, so the self-dialogue of, of, of doing that, I think, even through the plans, like having that self-dialogue to critique yourself and review and try come up with a better plan is very relevant to this. I think it all it all puts us in a better situation where we can allow more of ourselves to be because 
we we know that self we know what it's like and we know how that self should fit with other people's selves and not impact on them because you know every time you impact other people's selves then they're going to have to defend themselves and then that will not end well so so learning ourselves uh, allows us to you know engage with others in a way that is harmonious and that doesn't uh, you know, destroy the we space. It allows both selves to actually be there and partake of the gifts that that we space has to hold. Uh, yeah, there's a lot there. I don't think I can cover it all. There was something about mood that I wanted to touch on, but I'll pass, pass it back to you. Maybe we'll, we'll touch on that later. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And we need to touch on that as well. But I really love the... Um, wow, you gave such a great explanation about visualizing or you know this concept of seeing things play out i think that's so so powerful and i tend to be a visual person as as well as kinesthetic like it depends on what i'm learning about or what it is that i'm doing but generally when i'm going to events or planning events i tend to visualize them out and i think okay if i'm going to this spot i can sort of see where that location is and so i did a similar thing where i visualized this location because i knew it and i work very close to that location and the thing was that for whatever reason on that day, I completely forgot how I had planned it all out. And I found myself relying on the um, GPS and the GPS took me this other way where it now led me into this traffic and then um, it started to pour, uh, raining. And then it was just one thing after another that really just threw me into a bit of a spin. And I sort of found myself just not knowing where I was, losing my bearings and being frustrated because I had planned it all out. And so I only remember that I had planned this out in my head um, as I'm sort of at the end of the trial of trying to get there and, and it's getting closer. I'm like, oh, but I had this all other plan. Oh no, it's just come to me. And so I think I really appreciate what you've shared in regards to looking at ourselves and paying attention to ourselves and um, being in tune with what we're doing, why we're doing it. And I think when we, myself, when I look back at what happened, I go, okay, what was, why was it that I forgot those things? And perhaps for myself, when I consider my habits and I consider the way that I uh, tend to be, perhaps it is that I'm always trying to do so much. And so there's an overwhelm of information and overwhelm of tasks and lists and never ending um, events to attend or maybe things to reply to. And so I need to take a step back and just have, like you mentioned, those quadrants and really look at them and, and how to best prioritize uh, where my energy and my flow uh, of creativity goes because it cannot be spread across all these different things. You know, life happens, right? For all of us, we've got our family, we've got our work, we've got personal things that we're trying to grow on. And, and I have this constant insatiable desire to grow and to be better and to improve and um I think I'm at this point where realizing that I really need to look within has been so powerful because I'm not looking for external things to complete or to add or to um, do anything. I'm sort of turning within and it's it's been both a great process and a frustrating one because this obviously with anything when we're changing at the core of who we are, uh, it tends to be this challenge that can I don't know. It's it's like it's hard to sit with yourself and and look in the mirror and say the things that you've been doing for so long, and to you know the process of maybe forgiving yourself or the process of recognizing that certain set behaviors are not conducive to your way of being or they're not conducive to others, and it's like you have to sit in a, with a mirror in front of you and go, "I'm sorry for behaving the way that I did. I'm sorry for being the way that I was," and that brings that awareness to be like, okay we can reset. Let us look at how we to best present in the world and be aware of what we're putting out there. Because um, whether we like it or not, and whether we're aware of it or not, what we put out there is felt and it's and it's seen, right? And so people don't remember what you say, they don't remember what you did, but they always remember how you made them feel. Um, and so you've made them feel not only by your words, but also through the emotions that you send out. Um, it's your body language. It's it, you know, there's a, we emit a certain, um, you know, spiritual, if you like, or 
into the atmosphere, spiritual sensation and with everything that we carry. And I was listening to this um, Caroline, Dr. Caroline Leaf. She talks a lot about the brain and she's an expert in, in, in the brain and neuroscience. And she spoke about how when we're frustrated and when we're in a negative state of being, like I'm thinking negative thoughts and I'm perceiving all the terrible things that could happen about a situation, we're actually emitting toxicity within our own brains. And over time, that toxicity builds up and results in things like cancer or illnesses. Um, and that toxicity doesn't just affect us, it affects those around us because that toxicity now touches other people that in particular we do life with, right? Or we do close relationship with. And so we need to be mindful that it's not just how we're talking, it's not just how we're being, but a large part of what we're sensing. Because sometimes, you know, people talk about masking you know, you can just pretend you're just going to mask what's going on inside of you. Um, and I love the correlation you gave about, you know, children when they do play pretend, for them it's very real. And what we'll notice with that is that children actually are so immersed in it that their bodies and their brains are believing that's reality. Like it's so real for them. Whereas for us, play pretend is like I can at an intellectual level sustain that, but then over time, like, I can only go for so long, maybe half an hour to an hour, but I can't pretend forever. Whereas a child, and this is what um, uh, Joe Dispenza also talks about in the book of The Habit of Being Yourself, is that a child can go on and on for days and months being that character. They embody the character so easily because they're so open to this other state of being because they, they haven't formed those rigid boundaries or habits that are set in over time. It's just fascinating to consider that we have this ability to uh, tune in even at this age and, and to, by paying attention, shift some of those components of our character or behavior or habits that we don't really like. Um, and I really appreciate how, um, you know, you made the correlation or you spoke about it's the little things, right? It's the little things that compound over time. And so... I have to often stop myself and appreciate the little things and be like, you know what? You actually were better than any other time. Like this Saturday, even though, yes, you, you felt a certain way, you actually presented a lot better and you got over it a lot sooner, like almost straight away. You, you got over it. And then, yeah, there was another thing that upset you, but then you got over that as well. So it didn't linger on for the amount of days that it would normally linger and so I can see that I've done a lot of progress that over time has compounded and now enables me to see even greater and to do even better, right? Because I'm looking at the little steps I've taken, there should be an appreciation for those because with those little steps is how I'm going to get over the hill. It's not one big leap and I would love one big leap, we all would, but that doesn't often sustain us. It's one big leap in the now, but can we sustain that long term? And it's in the little changes that allow us to then not only biologically, but physically and mentally sustain the change that's happening, which is um, such great news for us. That, you know, and even when we talk about the brain and the plasticity that uh, the brain is capable of, the ability to regrow or to, you know, sever certain neurons and uh, allow the disconnection between certain pathways that maybe we have ingrained over time. I just love that. I get excited that there is such capacity for us to transcend. Yeah. So I'll give it back to you. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that capacity for plasticity, I think it cuts across even through to ourselves. Like we, you know, the brain is part of, our, of us. Our system is a, a part of it. So the same, te the same technique, uh, I think is something that's always happening for us. Like, you know, like you, what is it with the skin always shedding off the the dead skin so that the, it could bring up new cells. So it's like when you look at it biologically, physically, the process of transformation is always ongoing and it's never stopping. Um, however, sometimes because uh, we live here in this, you know, <laughs> as this being, it feels like it doesn't change. It feels like it's always the same, uh, but actually it is, uh, it's always changing. Uh, an interesting example, as a parent, I find that when, I, when I'm looking at my children, they're always the same. Like 
I haven't experienced them change. However, when I look at pictures of them, you know, over time, side by side, I can see the change. And it's, it fascinates me, but it's like in the picture, I see it. But in my experience of them, it's like they have always been the same. It's like what, from the time they were baby, like I knew that spirit. Like I, they haven't changed. Like I feel like they haven't changed. Yes, yes, they have added new capabilities and they express themselves in different ways. Like they've taken the same thing they used to do and now apply it in a different way, but it's still the same to me. And I think we, it's just our appetite for the sameness, um, which I think we need because we need to be sensitive to that compounding effect, that history is like, it's really important uh, because then uh, you, we may lose our way. So we need, we, we need not lose touch with where we're coming from. Uh, however, on the other hand, we also have to appreciate uh, always that micro change that's happening and keep up with it. And, and part of it, like, you know, you had said earlier uh, before was, was the moods that come up, right? Like those moods, uh, th those w waves of moods are part of, you know, new emotional responses that we probably don't know how to relate to quite well. And it's like in the moment, the, the mood sort of like uh, captures you and is doing things to you and you're struggling to deal with it because you don't know it's kind of, it has you from a place you can't see it and you, you you're trying to relate you're trying to figure out what is this thing i feel like it's restricting me in this way um you see it a lot like in a, 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 a when a child uh is having a tantrum part of it is you know they're stuck in a, a mood that they don't they, they don't understand or know what to do with and before I knew this, it, 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 it would drive me crazy, right? Like, <laughs> I would just be wondering, why do they do this? Like, logically, it does not make sense. Like, I've articulated this. I've explained this. When you do this, this is likely to happen. Why are they not understanding it? And it so turns out that, oh, wait, uh, they, they may be understanding it, but something else is impacting them right now that does not allow them to be their normal selves. And so we have to, it's like we have to help bring them back to normalcy before, before we can now remind them of what they sort of like already know, like, you know, what the routine is, what the standard is. Um, without appreciating that, that shift, it's like, oh, we have to do some work to calm things down. Uh, then we sort of like escalate. We keep amplifying the mood and making it even, even in the process, we get trapped in it as well. So, you know, we get sucked into the tantrum and then we feel lots of negative emotion and, and everybody's grumpy and sad because, you know, someone else wasn't feeling well and they also don't want to feel that way. And so it's, uh, it's not such a great thing to do, but like if, by paying attention and trying to keep up with it, trying to uh, appreciate that this is an actual reality that's actually happening. Uh, we can't change what we don't accept. So we have to accept it first. Uh, and then uh, once we've acknowledged it, then we have a chance to try and start shifting it about. And, and we do that through that, you know, paying attention, like really looking within, like you've said, like really being sensitive to every little change. It's like, if we're watching how quickly the change is happening, then we buy ourselves time to respond, right? We, otherwise, if it's too late, then we won't have enough time to respond. It's like, you know, you, you give an example of driving with the GPS, right? Uh, when you miss a turn, the GPS will do a recalculation <laughs> and give you a new route. And, but that's because you missed the turn, right? <laughs> And so now you may wish you didn't miss the turn, but there's a problem. If you try to insist and take the turn that you missed, you're going to disrupt the world in such an unnecessary way that you even make life much worse for not just yourself, but everything else around you. And so uh, 
acknowledging our mistakes and and accepting that oh i did make a mistake is the first step to trying and improving and trying to uh, not repeat the mistake otherwise you get blind to it and it draws you into a direction that you didn't want to go and you end you know you end up getting stuck and that is not ideal at all i'll pass it back to you mm. yeah i really appreciate um what you said just then because it's when we get stuck in a rut that we're you know it, and i'm most fr- frustrated or it can seem like it never ends and it's good news for us to know that our brains are able to change and we can change and um, redirect the energy flow and uh, form new neurons and, and sever the ones that are not serving us and so um, it's important for us to understand where they all start i think the source or um, the root of the problem the root of where these all may might have come from and doing that work i think is really important because it leads us to a better outcome a better us right a better version of ourselves and i really appreciate how you were sharing the example of the tantrum because it's like with the tantrum right for a child that we also have experiences as adults right we've got things that work a co-worker might not be understanding us or we might get frustrated because we don't seem to get our message across. And so it can really elevate our emotions. And if we're not in this state of awareness to pick up on what it is that we lost in translation or where is the point of disconnect, then we can get caught up in a whirlwind of he said she said or she's intending this she's intending that these made up stories that our brains will fabricate that lead us to a less than desirable outcome they lead us to you know uh, disgruntled workers or um, they lead us to friendships that break apart and and we we don't want to do that right we we don't want to have uh I suppose, fragmented relationships or, or fragmented ways of being. Like, you know, when you show up at work, for example, and because you had a disagreement with a co-worker, then there's the silent treatment. Well, that, that's a fragmented relationship. That's a fragmented way of working because now there's going to be this impeding um, issue that doesn't allow us to communicate properly. We're going to communicate in a very defensive or maybe very cold way. I don't really want to talk to you, but I have to talk to you, so I'm just going to give you the facts and not going to give you much explanation, which then hinders our ability to be productive or perhaps to even serve uh, the cause at which we're working, right? Um, And so uh, it it just brought that up for me when I'm thinking about the tantrum and I'm like, wow, we have tantrums that happen in our life and it's not so much that these can be prevented because we do not control people on the outside, right? We don't control others' emotions and what they're coming with and their baggage and their inability to do the self-work. But we do control ourselves. We can have a say in how we respond. And and I was talking to someone on the weekend and say, like, I really want to leave you with this. You can't control what others are going to do because she was talking about how there was just certain things being done that were undermining her position. Um, and I said, well, while you can't control other people, work on, you know, controlling the state in which you respond work on paying attention to how you can show up in that situation regardless of what might happen or might be said about you because once you can work that out then it doesn't matter what happens on the outside you're going to maintain a more stable way of being and being means like my state of being right now and how as I'm transcending I'm still in peace I'm still in gratitude I'm still in serenity I'm still in in awe of what life is offering me. And so I'm going to then allow and be open to the possibilities that even a bad situation can be turned into something great. Right. And so I think, I think it, it, it's, it's this, yeah, it's a really important dynamic to pick up on. And, And what I've realized is as I'm, as I'm doing that work and as I'm engaging with people and getting, you know, more attentive and being more aware of what is transcending between us, before the whirlwind starts, right? Because I don't want to be caught up in the chaos. I don't want to be caught up in the tantrum. So I'm paying more attention to, okay, if something is beginning to feel like it's being elevated or people are beginning to be irritated and disconnected, what is what is happening right now? 
what is in this moment that is transcending that I need to pay attention to? And so I sometimes might pick up on, oh, there's a misunderstanding. Oh, okay, let's go back to basics. Let's let's go back to the message and then put the message in a different frame. Or there might be the issue of I'm not seeing your side of things because I haven't had that experience. Okay, let me paint the experience so that you have more context, right? And so I find that as I'm being attentive to that, I'm resolving situations and really avoiding the chaos that can result and often that might have had resulted because the ego got in the way you know like if my ego gets in the way I'm like oh I've got to be right I've got to be right but actually nobody's out to get anybody people are just trying to do the best they can there's just a lack of awareness as to how maybe we show up and for myself this has been a challenge because I often will say things to people like you know, I'll be direct. If someone's asking me a question, I'll answer it directly. And I'll say, no, you can't do that. Um, and not everyone's ready for a direct answer. People are still working out their stuff. And those who are not intentional with how they work their stuff out may find it a little bit confronting and a bit too much. And so if I was showing up to someone and said, you know, I think that you should do this and that work. And, and this is what you're lacking in, or this is your deficit. They might not take it very well. But if I got alongside that person and realized where their struggles are and what they're ready to hear, they might be more receptive to that. Um, and so I find myself uh, really being more intentional to assess the situation. Like, is this person one that is capable right now to hear a blunt truth? Or do we need to go the, you know, the, the, the scenery way where you just sort of use lovely um, perhaps, um, what do they call them? Is it synonyms or you use stories like Jesus used to write parables, right? He was saying yeah. in, in parables rather than saying, this is what you're doing wrong and this is what's happening. And so just, yeah, I think for me, it, it's been that challenge of, okay, students are not ready to hear the truth as you would just put it. And sometimes, you know, mature people and certain, certainly people within certain positions, I think, we we need to challenge each other to be at that mature level to accept the the truth as the truth is because in some situations you don't have time to give every you know and and to go back and forth and do this what we might call circling um but in some situations you just need to be straightforward so people get the message and there's no confusion about it and one of the ways that i found um or one of the instances where i found this to be true is you know when a page, when a student story is failing if a student's failing, I don't want to go around the, the roundabout way and say, oh, you know, you just did great. It was wonderful. But, you know, it's just a few things didn't work out. You know, because by the end of our conversation, the, the student is confused. And so there's a there's, there's a fine line as to how often you go into take the scenery route and explain things and work things out in circle and all of that. And then there's there's some situations where that just isn't, the case you you don't need to do that you need to recognize that the person perhaps is within a leadership position where certain maturity is, is required and should come as a standard with that person um that they will be able to handle uh what's being said and oftentimes you know if we really pay attention things are not said about us there's really said about processes and things that might be happening that we can influence, that we can change, but they're not talking about me personally as as Juana, right? They're not saying you have a terrible thought process or, you know, they're not attacking the very being of who I am. They're just saying in terms of the work or things that you're producing might not be adequate for what's needed. And so, yeah, I just, I, I kind of took it in a different direction, but I really felt, yeah, with that whole, picture you gave about the chaos it's like there's so much there that we can prevent in this situations all around us that can cause that tantrum that chaos yeah um, but we don't need to find ourselves in the, in the midst of it every time yeah no we, we don't have to uh we, we have the ability to sort of uh preempt and sort of like find a way out of it by preempting it and you know uh, by coming back to that stable ground, you know, the, the stable place where we operate from. And I think, you know, what, what you're sharing before, it's like you advise someone to sort of like prepare themselves, like have, here's something I prepared before. Here's a response I prepared before. It's like when I'm in a situation that seems to be uh, 
that I'm misinterpreting or that seems like somebody's trying to offend me, here's something that does not add to that that I have prepared before that sort of like allows to manage that situation. And so partly like what you're doing by, by, by having that preparation is really preparing what you, how you show up. Like, you know, you touched on showing up before. Um, I think it's very, very important to manage how you show up in a situation because then you're, you're prepared, then you know, it's like you have the correct stance of how to be in that situation and how to respond and play with it and, and you know, deal with it. Uh, but before you can do that, you have to like cultivate all these prepared responses, right? It's like, it's like an, a martial art almost. It's like you have to learn uh, the different moves of what you do so that you can respond appropriately with whatever is coming at you. And that takes practice, that takes cultivation. Um, but something interesting you touched on there is like when, when it's a situation that uh, requires like emphasis, you go ahead and do that. It's like, so, so you know when to go slow and when to like really be, a, you know, no bullshit kind of situation. It's like, look, we're going to cut through all the bullshit and we're going to go straight to the heart of the matter. And I think that's also really important. Like you have to, sometimes that assertiveness is what makes the shift, right? It's like going, you, if, if you respond to uh, aggression with, uh, how, how do I call it? Like an aggressive scenario in a slow way, you're not going to respond in time, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you're going to lose the moment. So you have to keep up with how quickly things are moving. And sometimes uh, if it's moving too quickly, then you also have to do something that's really a fast response. Uh, but still maintain your kindness and, and uh, all your other virtues as you do that. But you have to respond and be able to keep up because when you don't respond, then like you said, you know, it widens the gap and then you fall into the silent treatment and all the unnecessary conflict that is the ambiguous conflict. You know, like actual conflict is good because then you know what is being said and you can hear it, then you can respond. But this indifferent, ambiguous conflict whereby uh, it, it's all unclear, it's it's not a very good place to be because that extends for a very long time and no one really gets to know. Like, there's no opportunity for resolution. Um, and the other thing I want to touch on there is uh, something you mentioned about uh, the, 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 the exchange you, you're having with, uh, with people, especially like in a tantrum situation, um, especially in an adult tantrum situation. It's like, you have to play you you have to to have this awareness that you know you can hold an audience uh for someone in such a way that they can see how they are coming across right and in the process like if we all held audiences for each other then we are actually able to get the direct feedback uh it's like it's like i have to play in your truth uh, for a moment, just for you to experience the, the, the reality you're bringing forth, right? Uh, and so uh, uh, I watched this show, uh, Married at First Sight. There's a scene in there where this couple uh, has a fight, right? Like uh, the gentleman is a very level-headed person who doesn't uh, raise his voice or anything, but the lady is a very energetic person who always gets their way, and when they try to have a conversation or he wants to uh, bring a, a discussion about resolving a conflict, uh, they always just bash their heads, right? Um, and it, it, it went on several times that he couldn't, like that technique wasn't working. So he had to play her way. He also had to raise his voice. And it's not something he liked to do. It was terrible. He regretted doing it. Uh, but... It, it's sort of like, if you may call it, like he had to drop to her level so that she can so that she can see what that is like. Because when you're in different realities uh, and you don't have company there, 
you can get lost in it and you believe like it's uh it's just how life is right but when people come and visit you in your reality and play your game the way you play it and interact you with you the way you interact with them then all of a sudden you're seeing how you come across and now <laughs> and now you have an opportunity to start correcting yourself because you know you, you can see how you're coming across how you, you it's like people have allowed you to behave the way you behave as though that was the true way and now you disagree with it right <laughs> and by disagreeing with parts of it then you know it gives you an opportunity to actually correct yourself so that you stop being a nuisance to other people right mm -hmm. uh but but you need an allowance you need an audience you need some company there otherwise um you know like you're saying before like it feels like an attack it's like are you just saying that because i look this way or because i'm this or because i think this way and so you, you can take it the wrong way but actually in most cases it's all about how you're showing up and how you're engaging and and we're blind to that because we are in the you'd say we we are in the midst of the showing up it's like we can't see it because we're doing it and that's a problem we need uh extra people to help us see it because they can see it <laughs> and they can watch us while we're doing it and then tell us uh however before we can even partake of that gift we need to be ready to receive that feedback and 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 hear what they're saying uh otherwise it won't help us like we we'll just keep you know stewing in our own trouble and our own way of being and if it's not working for us then it's not going to work and irrespective of whether they help us or not like we'll be stuck there yeah yeah and i really appreciate um how you said that because i think sometimes we can expect a lot from people uh and sometimes we can be indifferent um and i think as i've been doing more self work and and really focusing on who am i and how am i showing up and how are other people seeing me i've realized that at times i can be ignorant to other people's world and their emotions and their what one they might be going through and so one of the things that i've learned um and really been acute more acutely aware of recently is to see the humanity in everyone to and and when i see the humanity i'm seeing them as a person with limitations and seeing them as a person with um complexity and challenges just like i have and being aware that there are challenges that we can't just easily get over we can't just easily see our way through and so for some people it's going to be a diff and for all of us it's a different journey as to how we get over the certain things and how we overcome challenges um but just recognizing and respecting that it was really important for me because then i can take a step back and while i'm trying to convey my message or trying to help someone grow i can be attentive to their process and attentive to their uh progress as it's happening and so uh if i'm recognizing their humanity then i can be very forgiving much quicker uh, and allowing that grace right to sort of cover over where it is that they might not be really getting right now um and that's really told me then to take a step back and and to analyze where um i can shift and um be my better self for for others for myself um in terms of how it is that i relate how it is that i can see other people i think people really love to be seen i think it's one of the most impactful things that someone can do is to really see people because I, at the core of who we are we want to be seen we want to be acknowledged it gives us that sense of respect um and it upholds our integrity and so when we see people we can then better relate to people and we can get within their zone of uh because they feel they feel understood right and i think that example you gave of like you know he had to the marry the first side he had to elevate his or maybe drop his standard to relate to her um that's a really nice uh picture of like sometimes you you mentioned how we we have to see the the ugly side of us we have to see the side that people are really seeing and what we're really putting out um and 
this can be done in many ways and obviously he probably felt really squeezed to do in the way that she does it right to to respond in the same way because it was just not his message wasn't getting across and i think when someone's elevated like that it's really difficult for you to be in a quiet space and be like okay we're just gonna calm down i'm just gonna wait for you to breathe like no it, it's really difficult and often can push us over the edge where we react in the same way um one of the one of the incidents that i had with this was that i one time went to the airport i was picking someone up and i accidentally went way too early for the flight and i went over to the counter to ask about this flight because it wasn't coming i had waited for an hour and I said, what is going on with this? I was really elevated. I was very emotional and triggered, you know, all the things. And the lady simply took the piece of paper. She turned around because I had printed the details of the flight. She turned around and she let me look at it and she just pointed to the flight. And she said, so is this the flight that you're looking for? And I said, yes, that's the flight. She goes, and is this when it's coming? And I'm like, yes. And, that's it. and then she goes, is this the time that's coming? Yes. And so looking at the details, I realized, oh my goodness, I'm like way too early for this flight. It's like coming the next day. And so it was like in that moment, I had this realization that there was nothing wrong with the system. There was nothing wrong with anyone. I just misinterpreted the details. And so I had no right to be angry or upset or elevated or frustrated. I took my little piece of paper. She just smiled at me. And I just walked away, you know, and it was such a gentle, be a powerful way of showing someone that they're on the right, on the wrong track, right? Mm -hmm. You're on the wrong, tr wrong track. You're blaming things around you, but I'm not going to mention all of that because it's not important. What's really important is this is where the misunderstanding is. You have mm -hmm. missed the detail. And, and so I think, yeah, we can certainly um help people to see i think there's a tactful way to help others and i'm i'm sensing myself really developing into that person that is able to help people to see where it is that they might be missing the mark um and where they can um, take stock and and reflect on what it is that they're doing so they don't keep going back around the same pole right we want them to get better because the frustration is no fun and even the person who's feeling the frustration is not enjoying it like they're not happy that they're frustrated they would love to remove the frustration have great conversations and have thriving relationships in any domain right we all want that um so yeah i think it's really important to find tactful artful ways to present to people how it is that they might be missing the mark perhaps in their own life maybe they're seeking to find their own meaning um what you know, if, if we can give off something, what is it that we can give? And the other thing too, I, I noticed this weekend, I was having a conversation with, um, with a friend and she was telling me all these things about, you know, what she was going through. And I wanted to give a little bit of advice because, you know, like I went through that thing and I wanted to sort of share. And then I realized actually, because she was saying, you know, I actually spoke to so-and-so and I spoke to this person. I've got a few people saying this and a few, and I actually thought, she's done enough research to know what is best for her or if she hasn't done enough research she's gonna be able from what she's already shared with me in terms of what she's heard around her mm. i perceive she's got adequate information and perhaps enough voices speaking to her that she doesn't need my full account of what happened to me and how i dealt with it and so mm. i held back and i said actually i sense that you've done your research and you will make the right decision for yourself. You work it all out. And I think that's really powerful to recognize that even though people are not necessarily doing exactly the same thing that you did, and you might be sharing an experience where you went through exactly the same thing, when you're able to step back and say, oh, it sounds like you've done your research and encourage and empower them to look at their options, the ones that they already have and not pile anymore on, but look at their options and analyze what's best for them, then you're valuing the person. And what that tells me is that I've grown in my maturity to remove the ego out of the equation. And I think, and one thing that I love about um, this book also is that um, with uh, the habit, breaking the habit of being yourself is that it talks about the evidence that shows up when you do the work. It's the evidence of 
maybe your character that you've been trying to change or if you're trying to bring something into your life then you you know you might be getting that call for that job that you've been searching for but it's the little changes that you make that lead to the quality of life and the experiences and events that you desire and when you are attentive and you do the work intentionally when those little things show up they're very encouraging like for myself it was very encouraging to know that i didn't have to be in her face i wasn't like before where i needed to you know say this and that and and be like no but you got to do this because of this da, 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 da. because when people do that i've realized also from research and, and self growth is that i'm only speaking from my deficit i'm speaking from my experience and a lot of the times we speak from our fears as well right mm-hmm. because i've gone through it this way and oh my god but you got to be careful you got to do it this way because this is what happened to me like you're speaking from your fear and that might not be their reality so they're better off not knowing about it they don't need to have all the context they don't need to listen to your story right now they're going through that thing themselves and so if i can show a little bit of compassion and a little bit of empowerment that you know what i think you've got the information unless they're asking me directly can you share with me a lot of the times people have the information they need to make the right decisions and we really do need to as we're talking about you know us turning in and doing the work and being present with ourselves and being really intentional to pay attention to who we are we need to encourage others to do the same like pay attention to what it is that's speaking to you right now in this season or in this difficulty what is the theme what is the thing that's showing up what is the conversation you're having with yourself you know empower people to be their own guide because that's where the wisdom really comes from and i think people who are searching will always find the answers if they're searching authentically and genuinely and yes advice from friends is great but let us wait to be asked about what our perception or what our advice might be rather than us feeling the need to you know blurt it out and vomit all over the person and yeah. bible bash or whatever it is that we might you know in in terms of how we might do that um but yeah, I just really reflected on, on, on that and just recognizing my own self, like I have the ability to really connect with the person and recognize that they're a human and the core of who they are, they're a human. And when I can behold that in my visual, I interact very differently and very powerfully with people because then I take care of who they are rather than what I want as the outcome. Yeah. Wow, that's that's wonderful. That's really really good. Um, and I'm reminded of the the term holding a space uh, for others because what you're doing there um, is like really holding that space for them. And um, you know, it's kind of like what what is done in circling. Uh, you know, with uh, with guys uh, guys saying Stokes circling uh, method, whereby using um, appreciative inquiry like you know and holding a space for them you are able to curiously explore the experience and in the experience you discover you you know you will you'll put a light on all the gems that they already have that they did not know were there instead of you bringing all your experiences to you know feel you know feed into their own experience and so what you described there, I think it's really, really uh, an important technique to cultivate. And, and I think like it is, it is a, a big mark of maturity because holding yourself back in respect of another and like really um, allowing them to be is, is, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of awareness. It takes a lot of uh, patience and you have to be really a good listener to keep their attention on them, right? And and so like all the hesitation you are describing is like, oh, that I know of this Bible verse, but it's not about me, right? Oh, I, I have this wonderful experience that I would love to share, but this is really not about me. This is about them. I know this other experience of theirs that we can draw upon to amplify this thing that they're struggling with or that can give them the evidence they need to go forward from where they are right now and uh and you know holding up a mirror for them and sort of like talking through what it is that you know they, they're bringing to the table uh 
one thing that I've learned a lot, and even in having this conversation, I've discovered that when you start off by appreciating someone's work and what they've, you know, what they really are known for, what they're really good at, it's it's sort of like puts them into this relaxed state whereby they're now becoming more open and more, um, you know, relaxed to engage with you. And that is the level at which you want to engage with someone, right? You don't want to be in a combative state. Uh, when you're in a combative state, there's a lot of, uh, you know, conceptual defense. It's like you're, you're defending all these concepts that uh, you believe are under attack, you know, the beliefs and values, um, which may not even actually be in contention at all, but that's what you think. And so you kind of like get drawn there. So you, you're not listening to the person, you're more listening to respond. It's like you're trying to assess, are they attacking me? Are they, you know, are they trying to offend me? Uh, how do I protect myself? How do I cover that? Um, but that is not helpful. That does not really, you know, open up what else could be there. And so coming at it in a way whereby you're listening and you're, you're keeping it with the experience of the person, that I think is more appropriate and it draws them out more. It allows for them to be comfortable in their own reality and then they can see all the gifts that mm. are available to them that they, they that were there, but they did not know were there. And surprisingly, in, in most of those situations, like where I've, I've witnessed that, it's like people are so appreciative of you and you didn't do anything, <laughs> right? It's like all you did is hold the space. But they are so amazed that, you know, they learned something from their own experience, something that they already had uh, because you told them about it. Kind of like the lady uh, at the counter, right? Uh, all she did was point you to the facts of the reality. It's like, yes, you, you, what is the matter, right? Well, the plane is running late. Uh, which plane? It's like, here, I have all the information. It's like, great. This plane? <laughs> And you look at it and you say, yes, you acknowledge it's like, okay, great. And the one that comes at this time <laughs> and you check the time, then in the moment as you check the time, you notice that, oh, you, you misinterpreted, like you made the mistake. And she didn't have to be unpleasant about it. She didn't have to be mm -hmm. aggressive. She didn't have to call you about your recklessness. How are you? How is it that you didn't pay attention to all this detail, right? Like, you know, how is it that you're wasting all my time right now? She did it in a way that was very kind and uh, kept all the attention to the reality and held the space and appreciated that, you know, you probably have something else going on. You have, you know, life, life can be quite challenging. You know, you're probably having a bad day. Uh, and right now, this is the best way you can deal. And this thing is really frustrating you. And she doesn't have to take all that onto herself um, if she just points you to what you're looking at, you know, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're feeling. And and in, in in the process of that back and forth, she sort of like creates, uh, she brings you into your own reality to see it from the inside as opposed to see it how you're imagining it to be, like in a projected way. So, which is... This, this, you know, it, it sounds very simple, right? But it's, uh, it, it takes a bit of practice, and it, it's something that is amazing because, like, when you, when you learn how to do that, how to bring back the attention to people, usually the experience is that all the people who experience that feel like they've been really hard. They feel like they, they, they feel like they're, they're more understood when you engage with them, right? And so. It draws them closer to you. They feel like they learn a lot from you and they want to participate more with you. And even when you'd say like the attention you're drawing them is to something that may not be positive about themselves, they're much more open to listen to it and pay attention to it because of the way you're doing it. It's like it's really based on what's happening and what it looks like and just revealing that reality more and more so that they can see it better and mm. and know what it's like. And I think sometimes that's why that's where we fail. Like we we 
we, we add on that moral lens, that judgmental lens of like, this is good, this is bad. Oh, I wouldn't do that. And, and we want to go through that, that moral lens. But I think we need to drop further. Uh, we need to drop below the moral lens and go to just the state of the reality, right? Before we judge it as whether it's good or bad. Let's just first appreciate what is there, what's here now. The uh, in Vaveki terms, you'd call it the here nowness, right? It's like mm. we need to we, we need to get uh, uh, the suchness of the situation. It's like this is what it is, this is what's really here. Now let's see what it feels like. You know, let's deal with it. Like uh, not not fall into the past patterns that we we know, uh, but allow ourselves to resonate with it right now and see what comes up. And in most cases, it's going to be a whole new experience. We're going to see it in a very different way. Uh, and so I find that appreciative, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate that, that you brought that up. And um, yeah, and the other thing that it, uh, I'm reminded of was like, you, you, you touched on this as well, like, you know, the having grace, right? Uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at church and they were teaching uh, about balancing grace and truth. And uh, I feel like that's also relevant to this because uh, most of the time we get stuck. And I know, like I've been saying, you know, we have to bring the attention to the facts, like to the reality. But sometimes we over we overemphasize the facts, right? And and when you overemphasize the facts, you're going to end up in in the judgmental place. You're going to end up in uh, you know, in the moralism. Uh, however, you have to you have to try and draw attention to the facts while being gracious and being graceful, like acknowledging that you know you have to do this in a kind way. Uh, so, making a call out on someone, uh, but being kind. So, being clear about what is going on, but not in a way that makes their situation worse. Having that balance. It's a, it, it's a technique that needs to be cultivated. And like, you know, uh, Jesus was great at this, right? You know, everybody is calling out, uh, what's his name, Zacchaeus, the tax guy. You know, he's taken their money. They want to take him down. It's like, how dare he? And Jesus wants to go have dinner with the guy. And so he can, you know, hear his story. And, the, you know, they trade stories. They, they hung out a little bit. And... Zacchaeus feels like, oh, wait, actually what I'm doing is not cool. I think maybe I need to give these people back their money. It's like Jesus didn't tell him to do that. that that's yeah. the thing he did on his own. It's like so all good. Jesus did held the space for him to kind of like see that, you know, what he's doing. You know, he's a good person. It's like, he, he, make me a meal, right? Like bring out the goods. Oh, he, he organizes a meal. It's a wonderful meal. And so we have acknowledged that you're really good, like you can do good things. So how about these other things? Do you do you think they fit in within the good thing you can do? And then that puts him in a situation where, you know, he falls into the irony and and now he has to confront his own uh, dark self and uh, address it. And And I think we are the best people to deal with our own inadequacies, with our own uh, limitations. So... All we need is someone to, I think, uh, you know, what's his name? Guy has used this term before, and uh, Vaveki, like, we have to midwife this, <laughs> the, the, the situation such that we allow for what needs to unfold to unfold. So, so uh, as people who, uh, you know, participate with others, we need to kind of, like, just hold that space, like, bring them closer to what is there and do it in such a graceful and kind way and maintain the truth and let what happens happen. And always good things come out of that. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll give it back to you to see what, what's come up for you with that. Yeah, I, um, I had this visual as you were describing that situation with Jesus and how he was able to turn the heart of Zacchaeus to see his own reality rather than telling him, right, and just by the way that Jesus was being. And I really feel like, for me, what comes alive time and time again is that in our being, we transfer something. We transfer something to those around us. And there's a, 
you know, when people are carrying baggage and when they're unhealed, that healing is the filter by which they treat others and see others and see situations. And so when we have the capacity to face ourselves and ask the hard questions and do the work and our healing begins from a healed place, then you can impart healing. And it's when you can see then the humanity and it's that verse that says that to whom much is given, much is expected. And so for me, when I think about my journey and how God has healed me and the, and the intentionality I had to self towards self growth, I see the healing that took place and, and how it transformed who I am and how I now perceive other people because of the brokenness that I was in, it gives me a perspective for others brokenness, right? I can sit with your brokenness and I can perceive it from that really um, desperate, difficult place that you might still be stuck in. And I can see that you are trying your best. And instead of unloading on you all this advice and things that you should be doing and things that you could be doing and things that I could be doing for you or with you, I just want to sit with you now. I just want to create space for you because when I found that the most powerful way to change anyone is just being the channel by which they can transform themselves. And, And what I mean by that is, Let me sit with you and analyze or allow you to really communicate where you're at. You might just be in the midst of the pain. And so if you're talking to me from a negative perspective, I'm not there to change your perspective. I'm not there to absorb your perspective. I'm just there to allow space for you to hear yourself. And I think when I step back, I found this with my dad works really well, is I step back and I just let him have it. I let him him say whatever he was to say. I don't disagree, but I don't agree either because I need to remain integral to myself. But creating the space does something magical. And so when I create the space, then I can also meet you time and time again. And as you're realizing, wait, there is no judgment and there is no condemnation. There is no trying to sell me something or trying to tell me to do this and that. Oh, there's something about that person that I'm I'm really liking. And now they can begin to say, well, how do I become that person? How do I be more like the way that you show up? How can I be in this state of peace? Like people often ask me, like, there's just such a peace about you. Like, how do you how do you keep this peace all the time? It's like, I don't have to keep it. It's my intentionality to constantly be aware of what might be taking it away, right? you got to keep a, a, a vision on what is trying to steal my peace, right? Like on the Saturday I had the event and I wasn't exactly in complete peace. So I quickly asked myself, what is it that's still in my peace? Oh, the fact that I was late. Okay. I need to forgive. Let's forgive ourselves. Let's keep moving on. What's the next beautiful thing that's happening right now that I can appreciate and be grateful for. And Jesus did this and modeled this over and over again. And he was so good at allowing people to come to the realization of needing repentance or needing transformation. He never directly said that except for when we see it with the pharisees who lived in denial and i think there's a difference when you're intentionally living in denial like the pharisees who are just like i don't want to hear it i'm better than everybody else and that's when the ego is taking over and so i think that jesus was really directly speaking to the ego in them and the ego is that evil part of us that's trying to win and be all self-righteous but really it holds no substance And it's not sustainable because the ego will eventually kill you, right? And so I just, I love the parallels that you gave there. And I just really appreciate that when we come from a healed place, our ability to see people changes and people recognize that. People sense that. Like when I'm interacting with people now, people just know that even when I'm coming across a little sharp, they know I mean their best because they sense the the that essence by which I'm coming to them with. Like there's a loveliness about the essence of, I just want you to be better. I just want you to know that I care. And that is transferred through the emotion and the way that my body language is is coming across. And we know what it's like when you are conversating with um, a person who's angry, who's, um, you know, worked up. You, you know what it's like. You can feel it. You feel the atmosphere is charged. You feel their intensity. You want to take a step back. You want to move out of the, the way. And I, the same way you feel when someone's coming from a place of healing or compassion, authenticity, integrity, where they really value who you are and as you're presenting in front of them and genuinely wanting to be there to create the space and to create the ability for you to be 
or that you want to be, even in the midst of your suffering. They want to just sit with you there. And I think it's beautiful and it's powerful and we can definitely um, follow Jesus's model. And um, I love how this conversation evolved from beginning to talk about where, what am I being and how my you know transformation of being and showing up in the world um, has been shaped over the last few years. Um, and then just seeing the interaction and seeing the transference that that creates within my relationships and different dynamics. And I love the um, examples you gave. I always appreciate the visuals and I think they really speak to a lot of people because they're real life situations that we find ourselves in, right? We're dealing with children. Maybe you don't have children, you're dealing with a spouse. Maybe you don't have a spouse, you're dealing with a colleague. Maybe you don't have a colleague because you work for yourself, but you're dealing with your customers. You gotta have, you know, you're gonna have some stakeholders, some customers, someone that you're coming across, or maybe just the clerk at the at the store when you go, you know, maybe Australia Post or whatever it is. But you're always coming into relationship with other people and how that relationship evolves is really important. And we are meant to be um, collaborating, right? It's, it's in our nature to be collaborating and to be cultivating relationships. They enrich our lives and research has shown that they actually help us live longer and a better quality of life. So I really appreciate the conversation that we've had. And I'm so grateful for the way that, you know, it evolves and uh, the new ones that it brings. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna. I, and I have nothing to add to that. You've summed it up so beautifully, as you always do. And I'm so appreciative of this privilege of being able to have such a conversation with you. And I look forward to the next one. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.